This is a compulsory discipline case based on the respondent's conviction for insurance fraud uh, from between twenty and hundred thousand dollars in the one eighty fifth district court of Harris County, Texas. We filed our petition for compulsory discipline on November the uh, sorry yeah 9th, two thousand sixteen. The respondent was personally served with the petition and notice of hearing on November the twenty third, two thousand and sixteen by Ernest Darnell Brown, a private process server. Proof of service has been on file since January the 6th of 2017. We filed our first amended petition for compulsory discipline on February the 14th, 2017, and the first uh, amended petition for compulsory discipline was sent to respondent's attorney of record. On January the 21st, 2015, the respondent was charged in separate indictments with insurance fraud in cause number 1436421 and with engaging in organized criminal activity in cause number 1436422, both styled the state of Texas versus Ikechiku, Kechiku? Ike. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I butchered the name and I apologize to Mr. Nuisi. <laughs> New Easy in the 176th District, 6th District Court of Harris County, Texas. On July 7, 2016, waivers of constitutional rights, agreement to stipulation, and judicial confection were entered in both cases, wherein the respondent pled guilty to insurance fraud, $20,000 to $100,000, and to engaging in organized criminal activity. On July the 28th, 2016, Orders of deferred adjudication were entered in both causes wherein the respondent pled guilty to insurance fraud, twenty dollars to $100,000, and to engaging in organized criminal activity, and in each case was placed on community service for four years, and as a condition of community service, <coughs> ordered to surrender his bar license by September the 7th, 2016. At this time, I would offer the following exhibits. Exhibit one, is a certified copy of the indictment filed in cause number 1436421, styled the State of Texas versus Cage Two New Easy. Exhibit two is a certified copy of the waiver of constitutional rights and agreement to stipulation and judicial confession entered in the same underlying cause. Exhibit three is a certified copy of the order of deferred education entered in cause number 1436421. Exhibit four is a certified copy of the indictment filed in cause number 1436422, styled the state of Texas versus the page of Coup, New Easy. Exhibit five is a certified copy of the waiver of constitutional rights, agreement to stipulate and judicial confection, confession entered in the same underlying criminal case. Certified order is exhibit number six of deferred adjudication entered in the same cause. Exhibit seven is my original affidavit attesting to the fact that respondent is the same person identified as the defendant in the underlying criminal cases. Exhibit eight is a certified copy of respondent's prior discipline, a judgment of partially probated suspension entered in cause number H0031030. Zero five zero zero on January the 12th, 2012. And Exhibit 9 is the original cert certificate from Blake A. Hawthorne, Clerk of the Supreme Court, dated April the 3rd, 2017, indicating that respondent is licensed but not currently authorized to practice law in the state of Texas. I would offer those at this time. Any objection? No objection. Adm admitted. Approach. Thank you. Um, at this time, the commission would call Nancy Ashcraft.
May I sit at the council table and would you let yes. me know if you can't hear me? Thank you. Ms. Ashcraft, would you please state your name for the record? My name is Nancy Ashcraft. And how are you employed, Ms. Ashcraft? I am employed by the Chief Disciplinary Counsel's Office of the State Bar as the Statewide Compliance Monitor. And in that, how long have you been in that position? Eleven years. And in that position, what are your responsibilities? I review the records related to the disciplinary sanctions imposed against attorneys to determine whether the attorneys have complied with the terms of the judgments entered against them. And in that capacity, are you familiar with the judgment in cause number H00310355? I'm sorry, 500 Commission for Lawyer Discipline v. Ikechi Kunuizi? I am. What were the terms and conditions of that judgment? Mr. Nuizi was required to contact our office within seven days of receipt of the judgment. He was ordered to pay $1,725 in attorney's fees by March 1, 2012. He was required to notify his clients and opposing counsel in writing of his suspension by March 1, 2012. And he was ordered to submit an affidavit to our office stating that he had, in fact, notified his clients and opposing counsel and had returned all files and papers and unearned fees to the clients by March 1, 2012. He was required to notify in writing all the courts and judges in which he had any matters pending of his suspension by March 1, 2012 and supply an affidavit to our office stating that he had done so. He was also ordered to surrender his law license and state bar card by March 1, 2012. And he is required to keep membership, the membership department of the state bar notified of his current mailing addresses, business and home addresses, and phone numbers. And he was required to engage the services of a certified public accountant to assist him in implementing the proper trust account procedures and provide reports from the certified public accountant confirming that he had engaged his services and that the certified public accountant had provided a review summarizing all of his trust account procedures within 90 days of that review and also to continue with reviews by the CPA and reports from the CPA during the two-year suspension of Mr. Nuisi. How many payments did he make towards the attorney's fees? None. Did he turn in his bar card or law license to that judgment? No. Did he provide affidavits stating that he had notified courts and clients of the suspension? No, he did not. Did he provide affidavits stating that he had provided judges, magistrates, and chief justices with notice of his suspension? No, he did not. Did he provide affidavits stating that he had returned client files and unearned fees? No, he did not. Did he provide any confirmation that he had complied with any of the provisions requiring him to engage in a CPA for a review of his trust accounts? No, he did not. Did he contact your office as required by the judgment? No, he did not. To your knowledge, did he comply with the requirement to keep membership apprised of his current address and telephone numbers? No. What efforts did you make to obtain compliance? On April 6, 2012, we called his office and left a voicemail for Mr. Nuisi or someone from his office to call. It was a generic voicemail that we received, so we left a message for him to call. On April 11, 2012, I called his home number and also got a generic voicemail and left a message for him to call. On June 20, 2012, I sent a demand letter to him at both his office and his home address. The letter sent to his home address was signed for by someone. I'm not sure that it was. I was not sure whether that was his signature or not, but no, we sent it by certified mail and regular mail. None of the regular mail was returned. The letter from his office was returned unclaimed. And then I called his office again and his home 
on sept in September of 2012, and a woman who answered the phone said that he was at his office, and then she said he was in Nigeria, and then uh, I told her that it was important that we speak with him and for him to return my call. She took my name and number, but we never heard from him. And then in February of 2013, we, I tried to find him I did a search and got information that he may possibly be associated with a firm uh, in San Jose California his name came up and I tried sending a letter there but certified mail and uh, certified mail was returned from that address as well but we did receive a green card after the certified mail was returned uh, signed by a, a Miss Lee and after that, I had heard, I had never heard anything from Mr. Noisy during this time. So did he ever respond to any of those attempts to contact him? No. And he complied with no terms of the judgment? No. Thank you. I have no further questions. Do we cross-examination? Yes, John. So at some point, did Mr. Noisy's license got reinstated? Yes, sir. After the active suspension ended, he was returned to active status. Do you recall how he eventually got a hold of you to start the reinstatement process? Would you repeat that, please? How did he get a hold of you to start the reinstatement process? He never got a hold of me at all. So when you contacted the house at some point in 2012 and you were told it was in Nigeria, is that correct? Yes, sir, in September of 2012. And do you have any reason not to believe that he was out of the country during that period? I don't have any reason <coughs> not to believe that, no, sir. She had, the lady who answered said, first of all, that he was at his office. And then she said he was in Nigeria. And then the suspension term just basically expired. Yes, is that, sir. Is that what it was? There was no contingent term. There were no contingent terms in this judgment <coughs> to keep him actively suspended. So at the end of the active suspension, ending February 28, 2013, he was returned to active membership status March 1, 2013, effective March 1, 2013. No further questions, George. You redirect? No, thank you. You may be excused. Thank you. Anything else, Mr. Berry? Not at this time. We may have some rebuttal okay. witnesses. Judge, I would like to give a brief opening. You may. Maybe call some witnesses. <coughs> May it please the court. My name is Chris Eco. I represent Mr. Wese in this matter. You know, let me just open by first of all acknowledging that it's always a sad day in our profession when an attorney takes a witness stand in a criminal court in defense of, him, of himself. For that, Mr. Wese is deeply, deeply remorseful. And it's also deeply sorry for any negative publicity that this entire case, especially the criminal court case, may have brought to our profession. Today, Mr. Mwese stands before you in judgment. There are really two options. And in both options, it's just a matter of how deep the wound is going to be. So we are here asking for the lesser of the option. One option is disbarment. That he clearly does not want. Mr. Wes is almost 65 years old. Disbarment would almost be a career stopper for him. The other option is suspension. And we believe that when you take into consideration the totality of this case, that suspension would be the most appropriate remedy in this case.
Let me also say that Mr. Nwese accepts responsibility for the plea and the conviction in the underlying case. We are not here to relitigate that case. However, what I will tell you is we will try to present and provide evidence to you to enable you to order suspension in lieu of disbarment. The evidence in this case will show, especially if we are able to get in the complete claim file from the criminal court case, case involved in the underlying fraud charges. The complete <coughs> claim file is approximately 400 or so pages long. If you review the entire claim file, Your Honor, you will see that Mr. Uweze did not send in a letter of rep representing the undercover uh, officers that participated in trying to uncover the criminal scheme. Someone sent in a letter of representation, and that person is Leonel Iruka. And Mr. Iruka was with the law firm of Uyamandu, Iruka and Uyamandu. Some of these names are difficult to pronounce, but I do have, Your Honor, um, a schematic that I put together. So as I butcher the names, you can at least take a look at it. I'm not offering it at this point. You can at least take a look at it and see the name that I'm referencing. And may I approach? Right. Mr. Wazer did not send in a letter of rep representing these clients. A demand for payment for each of the undercover claimants was made in this case. Mr. Wazer did not send in a demand to the insurance company demanding payment for any of the undercover claimants in this case. Iroka and Uyamandu sent in a demand. So Mr. Wazer only had one encounter in this entire scheme that comprises of uh, Monterey Reyes, Jose Monterey Reyes. This guy does nothing but organizes to wreck cars, recruit claimants, and then send them to an attorney and also send them to a clinic. Mr. Wazer was not involved in all of that. He did not get involved in the planning or anything. The way Mr. Wazer got roped into this process was Leonel Iruka called Mr. Wazer to sit in for him to conduct an examination under oath for his clients, Mr. Iruka's clients. Now, Mr. Wazer not knowing the background or history of these clients, not knowing that they are undercover claimants, he sat, he sat in and represented them just for that purpose of the uh, uh, statement on that oath. Let me stop you right there for Thank a you. second. Um, you had indicated earlier that we weren't going to relitigate the underlying matter, but it sounds like to me all of this relates to that. Um, I'm not sure that's part of anything that we can do <coughs> in this proceeding. Um, so. Judge, I can skip that and not waste the court's time. I would appreciate uh, it. However, what, what we are asking for is the suspension in lieu of disbarment. I understand. And I, I think the court clearly has authority to do that. If you read Rule 805 and 806 together, that gives you the authority to do that. And also the matter of Caballero gives you the authority to do that, where the Supreme Court clearly states that you can do that. So and the suspension would run through 2020, is that what I'm reading, or is it a later date or earlier date? It, it will run concurrent with the uh, period of probation in the underlying uh, criminal case, which would be four years, and this started in 20, the judgment was entered in 2016, so that would run for four years. Yeah, you're right, if 2016 to 2020. That's how I did my math on it. The, uh, um, let me just ask sort of the larger question. Uh, Mr. Nwazi has um, 
and I appreciate your presentation and the points you, you've narrowed it down and I appreciate you getting really right to the, the nitty gritty of it. Um, he's had quite a few issues over the years with the compliance, um, with the disciplinary rules. Um, he's not a, a first time person. Um, uh, why would we choose the lesser? Tell me why you believe the lesser uh, discretionary act by us of suspension is uh, the appropriate sanction. Judge, let me just start by addressing the issue with respect to the previous suspension. Mr. Wesley was indeed out of the country d during that period. But what does that matter? He had an obligation under the law to do it. Agreed. I, I, I agree. I'm not excusing it, Your Honor. He has an obligation to do it, but if he will. But how is that a mitigating factor here? And to me, it's, it's the opposite, it, dwelling on, on that. Yeah, I, I agree, Judge. Uh, we don't have to dwell, dwell on that uh, necessarily. But if that were the only circumstances or situation you need to look at, that would be a different matter. However, we have more recent issues. I can't come here and begin to tout suspension as something good that you need to look at, and I also cannot come here and begin to tout probation in the criminal case as something you need to start looking at. However, we do have the probation that is currently ongoing with respect to the criminal matter. He is fully in compliance with that. He, he has done everything that the judge requires of him, including even getting the permit to travel to come here today. And I'm sure his probation officer will tell you that. And also, Mr. Weze is under suspension with the board's order from January. Recall that I applied for uh, a motion for continuance, and one of the conditions under which that motion for continuance was granted was that Mr. Weze be placed on suspension. And he did go above and beyond. There were some other things that uh, Ms. Ashcroft called to Mr. Weze's attention that was not even in the order that Mr. Weze just uh, gladly complied with. For instance, the issue dealing with the email, I uh, gave up his love and email and very quickly went to an individual email. And uh, he's also in compliance with the board order from January of this year. Well, let me ask you about that compliance because Exhibit 2, which has been admitted here, uh, in the judge's handwriting says four years DADT and surrender law license by September 7, 2016, as a condition of community supervision. It doesn't say surrender law license for a year, four years. Um, what exactly did the judge mean by surrender law license as a condition of this? My understanding of what that meant was that he was required to mail his bar card. Did he do so? He did, promptly. He did that, and I believe I verified that with uh, Ms. DeBerry and also Ms. Ashley. Yeah, so was, you're saying wait, it's wait, an wait, 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 what, Ms. DeBerry? I was going to say, he did um, initially mail his bar card, not his law license, but they brought the law license in later when that was brought to their attention. Oh. So it was that ministerial, not um, anything more than that, Mr. Eco? Th th that was all the judge I told him to do, and that was what okay. he did. How's he, how's he doing on his uh, restitution? Is he, does he have a, a, a payout uh, uh, a, uh, uh, agreement? And is he making his payments on that properly Judge, under, his, no. under his criminal deferred adjudication? Restitution was not ordered in the underlying criminal case. And the reason for that was that there was no financial loss to anyone. Um, the, uh, that's the reason restitution was not ordered. Again, this was an undercover scheme. A check was issued to Unyamadu and Ibuka. But my understanding was the purpose of that check was to just conclude the entire investigatory scheme. And so when they went there to deliver the check to the lawyer representing the undercover claimants, then they arrested him. So that check was never cashed. How about his other fees and costs? Is he current on them? He, he is current with his uh, 
uh, probation fees and basically doing everything that the court ordered him to do. He's reporting to the probation officer is, is directed. He's reporting to the probation officer, they ordered a uh, random drug test, which he did. Uh, no violations? No, no violations whatsoever. And did he pay the $1,750 in fees? Which fees? From the state suspension. The state suspension, the $1,750 in fees that were awarded? That I'm not sure. So the answer to your question, Your Honor, is no. Uh, and the, the reason being, he was out of the country at the time. So if that is something that uh, we, we need to do, surely we can do that. He, he can pay the fees. Well, he hasn't been out of the country for a year, has he? The, the, m m just so you know, Mr. Weze runs a poultry farm business in Nigeria, so he's out quite a bit uh, because of that. And his wife also has uh, an export clothing export business that she wants, which takes him out of it. But uh, other than that, he, he does do this traveling back and forth. Mr. Eco. But again, it's not an excuse. Yes, sir. Sorry. Are you aware of whether um, Mr. Nwezi was revoked on his prior discipline? If he did revoke on his If he was revoked on the plot prior disciplinary matter? Are you aware of whether he was or not? If he was revoked? Yes. Based on the testimony that we had heard earlier that he did not comply with all of those requirements for oh, okay. prior disciplinary action, do you, are you aware of whether he was revoked? My understanding was that he was not revoked, but he was ordered sus active suspension was for one year, and at the completion of that suspension, then he returned back to active status. But I don't know is if it, he was revoked. Is that accurate, Miss? That's accurate because we could not locate him to do a revocation. We, you know, if he was traveling back and forth during, I don't know that he was out of the country the solid two years, but we could not locate him. And, you know, as Ms. Ashcraft said, they gave us conflicting information when she called the home. So that's, couldn't be located to revoke him. The, the deferred adjudication required him to surrender his bar card and his law license and did he did he what did he do with his clients in any courts or anything at that point because the suspension or the when we uh, signed the order in january of this year required him to do all of those things had he done it by then the bar card which my understanding was what the criminal court judge was particularly about he mailed it in immediately but with the suspension in january he physically delivered the law license to miss deberry because is that correct mr Berry? yes it is it, it, that occurred in january of this year i believe it was january i couldn't swear to what date it was but they walked it over to the bar and was it at that point that he wrote the letters and returned any files or had he already done that or has he still to do that? Um, Ms. Ashcraft could answer that more specifically, but I do believe he has done that exactly when it was done. I do not recall. But I think he's in compliance with, with notifying. I haven't seen the letters that he sent clients. He did give us affidavits, I believe. Thank you. So, Judge, I believe you kind of like went into some of the um, Filipov factors in terms of trying to mitigate uh, the issue of disbarment. The, the factors in Filipov, uh, the Filipov's case that the, this court here rendered, there are essentially seven factors. Again, the biggest factor that we needed to grapple with is the one that you asked about, which is there has been some issues with previous suspension. 
to my knowledge, there has been one suspension that is not administrative. And the admin suspensions essentially also have to do with the fact that he goes back and forth quite a bit. And each time he comes back, he always paid in. But if I were doing it, I would send him the check before I travel. Uh, I'm not trying to excuse anything. But again, in this case, uh, if you look at the totality of the evidence, you have three suspensions or probationary period to look at. One was bad, two are very good, that he's complying fully. Mr. Wesley is 65 years old, never got in trouble with the law, except for maybe traffic tickets. His only arrest came as a result of the underlying criminal conviction that we are talking about here. And he, he knows better. He's, he's, he knows better. Anything else you want to offer? Any, any? Judge, I do have some uh, documents to enter into evidence. Uh, however, we could not agree on most of them. The complete claim file in the underlying criminal case, I would offer that. And again, just to show you how minimal his role was in this entire investigation that lasted one year. Mr. Wes's encounter boiled down to just 35 minutes to one hour. And he did that as a favor, professional favor to someone he thought was a professional colleague. And that's what we are here. That's why we are here uh, having this uh, case today. So uh, if I can get that in, that will help uh, to the extent that <coughs> you know, if you look at the entire complete claim file, you will not see anywhere where Mr. Wes's name shows up. The claim forms all have the name of the law firm, Iruka and Associates, printed and written all over it. The demand letter that you see in there is from Iruka and Uyamadu. The letter of rep that you see there is from Iruka and Uyamadu. The payment checks that were issued were issued in the name of each of the undercover officers and Iruka and Unyamadu. And the period of time that we are actually talking about, the entire time during which this investigation occurred between 2013 and maybe 2014, Mr. Nweze was uh, practically in Nigeria during that period of time. Like I said, he travels quite a bit. It's up to you what you want to do at this point. So let's yeah, yeah, I, I would like to offer that into, into evidence. Uh, if I do need to call a witness, I can call uh, Juan um, Aguilera. Uh, I, I'm sure he can, I can enter that in, into evidence through him. I'm, I'm not going to tell you what you can or so can't do. You just need to go ahead and... I, I'll call Mr. Aguilera. Are you offering the claim file? Uh, for admission under the Philippa factors? Is that what you're suggesting on yes, mitigation? Yes, for, for, for mitigation. And I do have two other documents that I intend to offer into evidence. One is the one that I just turned into you. This is a schematic diagram that uh, Mr. Weze and the attorney that represented him in the underlying criminal case put together to kind of like give you an overall picture of what was involved in the entire scheme. But as I was looking at this, the only correction that I need to make is at the bottom, where it says USAA, it should actually be U -A -U USAIS, United States Automobile Insurance Services, not USAA. So, but other than that, uh, that's that. And then the other, uh, material that I have to offer into evidence is the, again, another schematic diagram that Mr. Weze may, may approach you on. Mr. Weze and the put this together. And this just essentially says, follow the money. And it shows that Mr. Weze did not start to benefit anywhere at all from this entire uh, cr criminal uh, enterprise. The money was just going to essentially flow to the law firm, 
the purported uh, claimants, and then to Jose Antonio Antonio Martorell Reyes, that's the boss in the entire scheme. So at this point, Your Honor, I would like to offer those uh, three items into. Are they are they marked? You yes, Your Honor, they are marked. The. Well, he's, I'm going to object to all of these. The um, exhibit of the insurance claim information is not authenticated in any way. It claims to have a business records affidavit, but it's not notarized, and it's not a certified copy from the court. Um, these I would object to as they're basically going to the underlying case and not relevant to these proceedings. Judge, the complete claim files can be admitted in two ways. One way is the, it is a record of prior proceeding, evidence from a record of prior proceeding. And I can call Mr. Aguilera and see if he can present testimony to do that. The second way is under Rule 201 of the Texas Rules of Evidence, adjudicative facts, this court can take judicial notice of the evidence from a prior proceeding under Texas Rule of Evidence Rule 201. Can we see what you want to offer? I haven't, what, what do you purport to offer? The, the, this is the complete claim file. I have 12 sets me, and this was also filed You've already this filed it with us? Yes, this is Respondent oh. Exhibit And your point is, is what in offering this exhibit? Essentially, a couple of points were on one. May we see the schematics, please? The schematics. Yeah, it's exhibit yeah. two, yeah. I think. I can pass it. Those two. show how little your client's involvement was in the underlying matter? Essentially, Your Honor, yes. For any other purpose? And again, in, in and I'm talking about, I guess both the exhibits, R1 and R2, 
are they offered for any purpose other than to show how limited his involvement was in the underlying matter? It, it, that, that's one. Uh, secondly, just so you can get the total picture of this entire scheme, um, that he never participated in any way in, in planning or otherwise uh, involved, other than the limited purpose of sitting in for the examination under oath at the request of a professional colleague. And is it your position that we can consider that as a mitigating factor? Yes, as a, as a mitigating factor. Under Philippoff? Under Philippoff, yes. Anything else that you want to offer, either by evidence or testimony? I, I could do that, but I don't really want to waste the, waste the board's time. Uh, I can call Mr. Aguilera. I'm, it, it's, yeah. it's up to you. I'm not going to sure. tell you what uh, to do, I'll, but I, I want to. I want to make sure that you've had your opportunity. So sure, I'll, I'll call Mr. Aguilera. Let me ask you something, Mr. Eco, if you know. Um, you said Mr. And, uh, Maturel Reyes was the was the main uh, party in this in this scheme. Do you know what his uh, the outcome of who was he indicted and what happened to him? I believe it was, and we can get some clarification on that from Mr. Aguilar. Okay. Aguilera, but that's my understanding. All right. And were other people indicted? How many other people were indicted? I believe everyone that was involved in this scheme that you see in that chart, I believe they were all indicted. I don't know if Patrick was indicted. Or not. Okay. Will Mr. Aguilar be able to clear that up for us? He should be able to. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Aguilera, how are you employed? Sir? How are you employed? I'm currently a um, special agent with the Criminal Investigations Division of the Texas Department of Public Safety. And did you have an opportunity during the course of your employment to investigate an insurance fraud, fraud scheme involving Mr. Jose Motorea Reyes? I participated in the investigation. Okay. And <coughs> as part of that investigation, did you do like an investigative report? I did, I did some investigative reports. Okay. Did you review, for instance, the claim files from the insurance company? No. Did you review the medicals from the clinic, Ashdown Clinic? I did review some of the files that uh, pertaining to my undercover work. Okay. And if I were to <coughs> show you what has been marked as Respondents Exhibit 1, you'll be able to identify for me the portions of the file that you reviewed. It's probably taking a little bit, I'm going to go through all of them. Where there are medical records in here that pertains to you as part of the undercover the work that you do? It has my alias in here, yes. Okay, which portions of the file has your alias in Why don't we just do it that way so you don't have to go through 400 plus pages? Okay, what was the question again? What portions of this claim file have your alias in um, 
Officer, can, can we stop for just a second? Sure. First, uh, officer, we thank you for your service to the citizens. Uh, there, uh, I want to make clear that in asking you some of the questions about aliases, that we're not in any way uh, putting you in danger uh, or anything like that. I assume this has all been uh, fully adjudicated and is public uh, record in that sense. That's correct. I've uh, talked to Ms. DeBerry about it and some of the uh, precautions that we're taking right now. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'm not exactly so, sure what the boundary of that precaution <coughs> is. I don't. I know. I want to. I don't need to know that. I just um, unless there it becomes material. I just wanted to make sure that there were protections in place that we didn't do anything that would endanger the officer. And to answer the question, uh, my alias is on the health insurance claim form. Okay. That's on this particular one, right? Yes, well, there's a couple of them. So if, if I mention <coughs> that name for the record of that, in any way jeopardize your ability to do some future undercover work? If you, the name? Yes, I just. It's it possibly will. Okay. So, <coughs> but at least from the claim form, you can tell that the attorney's names are on that form is not Mr. Wazer, right? Correct. Um, we, we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't hear you at all. You're talking. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe I need to sit down and try No, to no, I think if you're at the microphone, yeah. it's easiest. <laughs> okay. Um, as part of, again, I'm trying to calibrate this well so I don't go afoul here. Please um, speak into the so, microphone. So, Mr. Aguilera, the did you, when you signed the contract for representation in the underlying case, did you sign that contract with Mr. Mweze? No. Who did you sign the contract with? I'm gonna refer back, I'm, I might butcher the name, but it's, it was Mr. Emika Michael Uyamadu. Uyamadu, okay. <clears throat> Uh, to your knowledge, when demands were made for payments to the insurance company, did Mr. Weze present the demand for payment? Sorry, I, I didn't. The demand for payment that was made to the insurance company <coughs> on your behalf, purportedly, did Mr. Weze present that demand to the insurance company? I can't answer that. I don't know. The payments that were issued, at least the one that was issued in the alias that we talked about that pertains to you, was that issued in your name and the name of Uyamadu and Iruka? I don't recall that. I can't answer that question. If I show you from the file that you have a check that was issued, would you be able to, would that help your recollection? No, my role in this case was the investigative undercover work. Uh, another agent was the case manager that oversaw the entire case. So my role was predominantly the undercover role in meeting with uh, the person staging the accidents and at the chiropractor's office. Did, did you have any direct contact with Mr. Nwazi? One day, one time. And what was that? That date will be... June 25th, 2014. What was the nature of that contact? That day we had a uh, deposition with the insurance investigator scheduled and we go to the office um, at 8303 Southwest Freeway in Houston, Suite 900. Uh, that was a prior location that we had met with Umayadu um, and I was we were the, under the impression I was assuming that I was going to meet, meet with Mr. Um, I'm going to die you, and I didn't on that date. I met with Mr. Nwezi. Was it your understanding he was sitting in for, for the other man? That's what he told me. Did you have any reason to believe otherwise? No. Okay. Did you develop any opinion as to <coughs> the scope or, or how big this fraud scheme was and Mr. Nwezi's role in it? I, I, I did not. I didn't know how big it was or who all the players were as far as the 
from this office that we were at. Do you have an opinion or any facts to support it as to how involved Mr. Nwazi was? Um, just facts of, of, of the actual day when he, uh, prior to meeting with the adjuster or with the insurance investigator for the deposition, he coached us on what to say, what not to say, how to answer questions that the investigator would present to us. Um, he mentioned, I asked him about Uma Dayu because I hadn't never, I hadn't met with Mr. Nwazi and uh, he, he told me that uh, Mr. Umadayu was the office manager and he was the lawyer here. So, um, you know, we go through the process of the investigation and we come out and, you know, that's, okay, thank I you. believe that he was involved. Yes, With respect to the coaching, did it strike you as routine? Uh, uh, just answer the question and nothing further or did you believe it went beyond? No, it was, it was, it was routine. Uh, don't give more than what you're asked uh, type deal. Uh, if you don't know the, the answer, say I don't know. Be truthful. It was. Do you know what the outcome of the other people that got indicted were in this case? Did I, any I, of them go to prison, to your knowledge? I don't know. Okay. You know if any of them got similar pleas or made other deals? I don't know. And he told you to be truthful? Yes. Anybody else? Have any, do you have any further questions for the witness? No, 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 I, no, I have one more. Go ahead. Uh, the incident when you met Mr. Nuezi was in June of 2014? Yes, sir. June 25th, 2014. Did you have any role with respect to the April 1, 2014 that was the basis of the other indictment? April 1st, 2014? There were two indictments. Uh, one for June 25, 2014, the other one for April 1, 2014. Did you have any involvement, undercover or otherwise, with respect to the April 1, 2014 incident? I did meet up with him on April 1, 2014. Could you describe that? Yes, sir. Let me... Uh... <coughs> Sorry, was the question that I met with him on April 1st? Yes. I did not meet with him on April. It was just that one day. I'm sorry. I met with the uh, another person. Mr. Burkett, anything else? No, thanks. Anybody else have any questions for the witness? No, I do. Oh, okay. If I may. <clears throat> just to be clear, when you said you met with someone else, was that Mr. Yamadu? On what day? On April 1st. Uh, April 1st. No, ma'am. Okay. Did you, um, were you aware that Mr. Yamadu was a disbarred attorney? No. So when you met with Mr. Nuisi on in July, did I hear you say earlier that he told you he was the attorney handling the case? I believe the meeting was June 25th. June 25th, I'm sorry. Thank you. It was June 25th. My question was, where was Mr. Uyamadu? Um, and Mr. Nuizi told me that he was, Mr. Uyamadu was a case manager in the office, and Nuizi stated that he was, I am the lawyer here. Okay. So, prior to that time, were you under the impression that Mr. Yamadu was the attorney? Yes. Okay. And he had never told you he had been disbarred? No. Um, when you were speaking to Mr. Nuisi about the accident prior to your deposition, did you have a discussion about the people that were in the accident with you? Yes. And did, what was their discussion about, well, what was the discussion about one of the undercover officers that was not involved in the accident? We told Mr. Nuisi that one of the officers, undercover officers wasn't at the crash scene um, and we just told him to put his name on the accident, um, and that's what we did. Uh, we told the trooper that investigated the crash that there was another person, which he was never present. Okay. And um, I missed, I, I zoned out for a second. Would you take me through that again to make sure I grasp 
this <coughs> issue. Ms. DeBerry, do you mind just sort of repeating the questions yeah. here? And there was there there were three undercover officers involved in the investigation, correct? Yes. And is it my it's my understanding that one of those officers was not at the crash scene? Correct. And you told Mr. Nuisi that he wasn't at the crash scene? Correct. But he was going to testify that he was Correct. involved in the crash. Did he the third person, the third undercover officer was going to testify that he was at it? Yes. And did you tell Mr. Nuisi anything about that? I told him that he wasn't there. We just threw his name on the crash report. Okay. And what did Mr. Nuisi say? It's just, it's, I don't remember what he said specifically, but we continued. But was, you put his name on the crash report on your own volition as opposed to being told by Mr. Nuisi, is that correct? correct? Yes, sir. Did they take that officer's deposition? Yes. And Mr. Nuisi was present during that deposition? Yes. And so and what did that officer, and the officer testified? Yes. That he was present? Yes. When in fact Mr. Nuisi was told that he was not? Correct. Um, after the deposition, did you meet again with Mr. Nuisi? Yes. What other conversations did you have with him <clears throat> concerning um, possibility of future claims? He uh, asked us to send me, uh, send me more cases. I, I would appreciate it. Was he aware that they were not, that they were faked crashes? I believe, he, I believe so. Did he give you any instructions about what the, what type of cases, what type of crash you should do the next time? Yes. And what was that? A, a two car crash. Okay. Um, did you ever have, besides Mr. Yamadou and Mr. Nuisi, did you ever have contact with any other attorney? No, ma'am. Regarding this? Okay. Were you ever told that any other attorney was involved in this case? No, ma'am. Okay, and I believe Officer, do you believe that Mr. Nwesi was filling in for Mr. Yumadu, Yu, Yumadu uh, because he knew Mr. Yumadu did not have a license, had been disbarred? I can't answer that. I'm not. Did he call Mr. Yumadu uh, an office manager? Correct. As opposed to a lawyer? Correct. Did the office where you uh, went, did it have a sign that displayed the names of the lawyers, I think, Iruki and Yamadu? Correct. It did have that. And so it, the sign, in essence, represented that Yamadu was a lawyer? To my belief, seeing the way it was, the sign was, was presented, I did believe uh, Umayadu was an attorney. Okay. Was, let me ask one more question. Was Mr. Iruki's name ever mentioned? Not that I recall. Okay. Thank you. Pass the witness. Officer, may I ask, do you recall how many times you had contact with Mr. Uh, Uamadu? Once. Okay. Any other questions from the board? <coughs> Anything else, Mr. Nico? Just one quick question. Yes, Mr. Umweze did advise you to tell the truth during your examination on that oath. Is that correct? Yes. And he never at any point mentioned to you that Mr. Yamadu was a lawyer or an attorney, did he? I don't believe he did, no sir. And then, how do you, if you know, if you don't, let me know. How, how did Lionel Iroke get involved in all of this? Because all the paperwork you have has his name. I don't know. He signed off as a lawyer in the paperwork that you have. You, you never met him, and he was representing I never met you. him. Yamadu, you can agree, did not sign off on any of those documents that you were looking at. That is the portions that pertain to you. I, I would have to re look at him again. I'll pass the witness. I have no further questions. I do yeah. have one other rebuttal. Well, 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 hold on. Let's see if okay. Mr. Eco has anything else. Judge, I'll call. Uh, yeah, Mr. you can be. You can be. Thank you, sir. Thank you, officer. Thank, Thank you for your service. You, you
you can go ahead. I'll Mr. Eco, are, are you finished with your presentation? Yes, sir. You rest? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Okay, Berry. At this time, I would call Scott DeRoches. State your name for the record. Scott DeRosha. And what's your occupation, sir? Work for Texas Department, <clears throat> Texas Department of Public Safety, Criminal Investigations Division, Special Agent. And how long have you done that work? Uh, ten years. Well, I've been in DPS ten years. Uh, in Criminal Investigations Division, about five. Right. And how did you first hear about Mr. Nuisi? I first heard about Mr. Nuisi after the uh, the meeting on June 25th, okay. 2014. And at that time, did you all obtain a search warrant? In did, July. In uh, July, yes, you did. After, after that occurrence. And did you help execute that search warrant? Yes, I did. Um, when you went to Mr. Nuisi's office, and I'm. Uh, do you recall where that was located? The uh, the eight three uh, zero three Southwest Freeway address, I believe. Okay. Did you search? What areas did you search at that office? Um, the in, the entire office. So did Mr. Nuisi have a separate office from other people in the building? In the, yes. In the, was it an office suite, like several rooms in the yes, suite? Yes, it was office suite. Uh, uh, several different rooms, common rooms, uh, a back storage room. Okay, and where did you locate evidence that was relevant or that you were seeking in the search warrant? Uh, all over the place. Uh, I mean, the whole office building. Uh, some of it was in Mr. Nuisi's office? I'd have to review exactly where each item was taken from. Uh, but yes, we were in his office. Okay. Did you find anything in Mr. Ruku's office relevant to the search warrant in this case? I don't believe so. Okay. Um, based on the information that you, uh, the evidence you got through the search warrant, what individuals were implicated in the insurance fraud scheme? Everyone that we charged. It, Who all did you charge then? <laughs> uh, we charged uh, Jose Antonio Matarel Reyes. Uh, we also charged his girlfriend, uh, Elsa Guria, I believe was her name. Um, Patrick Oswego. Uh, Deborah Osmus, uh, Mr. Nuisi, which a total of six. I'd have to. It's Was the other one Emika Michael Yamadu? Yes, Uyamadu, yes. Total of six people. Okay, and were you talked about Patrick, and I can't even begin to say his last name. Was he part of the law office, or were, was he part of the. Um, Patrick, Patrick, Patrick was uh, at the chiropractic uh, clinic. He was his title on that was displayed was principal of the clinic. Okay, so not all of these people were with the law office. It was basically Yamadu and Mr. Nuisi. At the law office, uh, the only people we came in contact with ever were Yamadu and uh, Mr. Nuisi. Okay, thank you. I pass the witness. Cross-examination. I have up. a couple of quick questions. At some point when you had contact with Mr. Wesley, June 25th, 2014, I believe it was, he, he gave you his business card? I didn't have contact with him. He gave the undercover officers a business card. Do you recall? 
Did you see the business card? I believe so. May I approach you? You might. <clears throat> Is that what it looks like? You can have it. I have enough copies. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, I believe so, because we are wondering why it's a uh, why it's a different name using his name but the same address. So, okay, yes. So you don't have any uh, reason to believe that he was sharing office, like it's an office share type situation. Well, that's the same address as yeah, s same address. So, same suit, office share. Yes, same. He's in the same office. Right, but he's got his own separate office. Correct. He had a separate office, yeah? Okay. Within there. With, within the main B office, right? right. yes. This is our formal approach. card that you saw essentially looked like this one, is that correct? I'm sorry. Is, what, what, what's the exhibit number? Uh, R4. Are you offering any evidence? Y yes, you are. Mr. Baer, do you have any objections? No objections. Exhibit number four is admitted. So the you mentioned that there were six individuals connected with six this. defendants. Yes, six, six defendants that were arrested. Right. Yes, correct. In your estimation, was Mr. Weze did he play a major role in this whole scheme? Did he play a major, in my opinion? Yes. Yes. How is that? Uh, because he's the attorney. He's the attorney that made it happen. Without the attorney, they can't. Uh, I mean, the that's how they got the most money out of the uh, the claims. So, is it your understanding that he was the attorney that represented the undercover agents from the very beginning of this case of the underlying criminal case? Well, they met with Uyamadu first, and then they met with Mr. Nwizi. May I approach you, Honor? You may. Your Honor, I'm looking at uh, Respondent's Exhibit 1, and if you just, like the third page, say correspondence there, that is dated June 18, 2018. 2014? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm one year ahead, right? 2014. Could you take a look at this, please? Mm 
It says this office represents. That's not Mr. Onwezi's office. Is that correct? What? The name? I'm going yeah. to object for just a minute. Um, that's one of the names we were going to keep out. I moved to strike it from the record. That, that's why I'm not calling it out. You just said. You I, just, I just did. I just point, You I just, just yeah, you did. Oh, oh I'm yeah. so sorry. I, I, so we need to make sure that gets taken off. Did that. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, that, that was not my intent. Well, let's be clear, though, for the record, uh, precisely what is being redacted. I assume it was the name that the was The name mentioned. of the client in yes, this case. Yes, right. yes We'll you. leave that, but that'll be redacted. Okay. From the videotape as well, please. Yes. Okay. So, I'll just call it DP1. Is that okay? That's fine. Okay. So, this office represents DP1 mm -hmm. in a claim for injuries received in an accident with your insured. Is that correct? Yes. So, the law firm that is representing DP1 is Iruke and Uyamado. Is that correct? Correct. And that law firm is not Ike Uweze and Associates. Is that correct? Well, it, it's the same address. I, I understand that, but the question is a simple one. This is a demand letter that you are looking at. Right. Presenting a demand for payment to the insurance company. That letter did not come from Uweze and Associates. Is that correct? Well, it says it came from Aruki and Uyamadu. Okay. And it also says that Iruke and Uyamadu is the one representing these clients. Actually, I think the letter speaks for itself, and it okay. says, quote, this office, end of quote, represents. Right. It doesn't specify who. Uh, uh, Your Honor, if you look at the top of that letter, mm -hmm. it, it's got a letter heading this, Iruke and Associates. And if you go to the second page of that oh, letter. Oh, I read it. Uh, it starts with uh, this office. Yeah. I'm talking about the letter head. Oh, I understand. understand. And then there's also a signature block that has uh, Lionel Iruka. The letter speaks for itself, and, and I, I don't see how you're questioning the officer personally on matters that are beyond anything he knows about. Do you have anything else, Mr. Eco? Let me see, Jeff. So again, just so the record is clear, the only encounter you had with Mr. Mweze was on June 25th, 2014, is that correct? I didn't have an encounter with him that day. The undercover, the undercover officers had an encounter with him okay. that day. I'll pass the witness. One question for you, uh, counsel. On Mr. Uh, Nwezi's card, it, uh, it says on the far right-hand top corner, uh, there's a, a name. Uh, you Bubba Dyke, I su suppose. What does that mean, and who is that is? Does it mean lawyer in Nigerian, or what does it mean? Oh, it, it appears to be like a title. It is, if I can say it correctly, it's something like that. Yeah, it's said just a title. Okay. It's a nickname title. Yeah. It has not to do with the practice of law at all. I do have a question for the officer. What was your role uh, as a, in this investigation? I was what we call the lead case agent. Uh, I did reports. I coordinated efforts. I didn't do any of the undercover work. You did not do any of the undercover no, work? No. So I, you would not have been in contact with either Mr. Nwese or Mr. Uyamadu? Uh, correct, oh, yes. Okay. But you were the you would be knowledgeable about all the contacts that the undercover officers had with both of those yes. uh, defendants? Yes, correct. Okay. And were there many contacts in your, um, that you are aware of with Mr. Nwese, as well as many contacts with Mr. Uy Uyamadu during the investigation? Um, well, they went to several, they went to a lot of places. We, we had a, 
I think there was 19, well, there was over, actually ended up being over 20 reports. <clears throat> they had limited contact at the attorney's office. They went two, maybe three times to the attorney's office. Most of the time they were going to the uh, clinic. The, the first attorney they met was Uyamadu, and then uh, Mr. Nuizi was the second attorney they met. But the, the contacts with the attorneys, they, they were only at the office, or did they have contacts with them in other places, like at the clinic? No, it was only the, uh, the attorneys was only the 8303 address. Okay, thank you. Can I, can I trouble you just to, to give us an overview of the investigation and how it led to being undercover to this office? Uh, sure. Um, it started out with a informant, I guess you could say, that wanted to come forward and provide information on this scheme. Uh, the first person that the undercover officers got introduced to was the Jose Matarel Reyes. And he basically what he did is he is a recruiter to go around and recruit participants to be in staged uh, vehicle crashes. And then they make the claim on their insurance. And then uh, <coughs> Mr. Reyes will then take, take escort them to the clinic. And at the clinic was where Patrick Oswego, the clinic principal or owner, was. And then also the chiropractor, uh, Deborah Osmus, was. And what they do is they conduct uh, all kinds of therapy and uh, visits that didn't actually happen, uh, create paperwork, uh, sign paperwork, and leave the dates blank, and, and drive up the medical bill, basically, that didn't happen. Uh, the chiropractor would ask questions for several minutes without doing an examination. Um, then from there, Mr. Matarel Reyes would uh, escort people to different attorney's offices. The attorney office that he happened to take the undercover office, officers to in this investigation happened to be the 8303 address. And then uh, they ended up meeting with Uyamadu first, and then uh, Mr. Nuizi second, and going through that entire claim process that ended up being Roger. Anything else? Anybody else have any questions? No. All right. Thank you. you you're excused. Thank you. Anything further? Judge, I'll, I'll call Mr. Wizzer, please. Sorry? I'll call Mr. Wizzer. Mr. Nuizi. You're being called as witness. Office arrangement is an issue. So, can you please clarify for the court what the office arrangement was? Uh, I just got back from suspension and I was looking for an office space to stay. So, Mr. Yamadu, Iruka Yamadu, gave me that space. It was uh, once one of the have about five, five office spaces there or four. Then he gave me one where I was staying. That's how I came to stay in that office. And I have my own separate telephone, you can see from my card. I have my separate fax. And I have my own separate name. Now, did you accept responsibility for the role you played, if any, in the underlying criminal case? I completely accept responsibility for it. I'm deeply sorry. I regret this moment of my life. This is not what I am. I am very, very sorry. Did you pay rent to uh, them? Yes, I do, Your Honor. Is there anything in the record reflecting that rent? Yeah, if you, there, there are records, uh, there are checks which are paid uh, to them, and I can produce it. 
if, if you want me to do that. Yes, Your Honor. I really, really regret this day that I will come before the Supreme Court to stand and testify in this position. This is not what I'm made for. This is not me. I've practiced for more than 20 something years. I really regret it. I'm sorry to have treated you this way. Mr. Nwese, are, are you a doctor? No, it's just uh, uh, the bad doctorship that we did and I left it. People keep using it to call me after the JD thing, but I'm a medical doctor. And in your law office, did you have any associates? No, it's just me. Okay, thank you. How much was the monthly rent? And please, it was $500 a month. Did you take any referrals as part of this scheme, if I can call it that, other than the one for the officer that we heard from? No, Your Honor. Was he the one and only client is, that you represented? This is one and only, and the whole scheme of event, which went over a year, my name was never mentioned. I was never there. I'm not aware of what's going on. If I knew what was going on, after speaking to them, and we are talking, I said, did I do a good job presenting you? I said, I said, well, if I did a good job, here's my card. If you have anything, talk to me. That was how that came about. And my question got, to you I got is, into this. you pled guilty to insurance fraud between $20,000 and $100,000. Is that correct? Yes, that's what his statement said. And is the amount of money that you obtained for the officer who was undercover who testified earlier some amount between twenty and one hundred thousand dollars? Zero. You got zero money for him? There was zero money. Correct? He did not obtain any money, is that what you're saying? Zero. What is the twenty to one hundred thousand represent? I think my belief is that that figure came there because probably they figured that the poor uh, man, whatever the demand they wrote there, I never saw that demand until after the fact. What was the demand, what the, the intent, the total cost of demand would be, but zero, completely zero. So you're saying that his claim was somewhere between a twenty and one hundred thousand dollars, but you never obtained any money for him. Is that correct? Correct. And. I think they get that figure because if, if I think the claim, the, the package you see, you can look through it. I don't think there was demand. Nobody paid any money to anybody. I didn't get any money myself. Zero. I never saw the check. Right. Anything else? Mr. Uh, Nuezi, um on June 25th, 2014, um, uh, the officer testified that you told him to tell the truth but that you told him that Mr. Yu, Yu Yamadu was the office manager and that you were the attorney. Uh, do you agree that you told him that Mr. Uyu Madu was the office manager? In the course of this, when I came in, because the lawyer there was uh, Leonardo Ruka. I know him. He's one who asked me to please do this for me. He was out of town, without the country. I believe it was somewhere in, in uh, Amsterdam. So he said, please do this present for me. And that's what I went in there to do. And I guess the question I'm going to, did you know at that time on June uh, 25th that Mr. Uyu Madu was not a lawyer? No, I'm not aware of him. I didn't know that. I have no questions. Anybody else have any questions for Mr. Nwesi? I have some cross-examination questions. Go ahead. Isn't it, you agree that they told you that one of the people wasn't in the accident? I saw, I saw that statement when they gave me the printout, but if you look at it, I did not reply to it. I did not, I, I did not give any response to it because I didn't hear it. I did not say yes, I did not say no because I did not notice it. But I saw it in the printout. But the they statement. told you that on the, on the 25th? I, I can't recall it because I didn't answer it. Well, I have a video if you'd like to see yourself saying that. No, they, they mentioned that I said right now, you know, we're just, we're just talking. I'm not memorizing what I said. So when they said, when they said that issue that somebody was, that, was, that a particular person was not in the accident and they were putting him there, 
I did not I did not respond to that. But you went ahead and went to that man's deposition as if he had been in the accident, correct? No. Both of them were there. I was given I was given the benefit of doubt that we are getting represented by the uh, represent uh, for Mr. Luca. Bear in mind, I'm not a lawyer in this case uh, because. Well, that's can I say this, please? Please, for you to accept a case, for you to be able to withdraw in a case, you have to be the person in charge of the case to say I'm withdrawing from this case. I couldn't withdraw. When I saw those things, I had a duty and obligation to tell Mr. Ruka, these people don't look so quiet to me. But he was not in town. You, so did, I, you don't think you had an obligation to correct the deposition of the office, the undercover officer you knew was not at the accident during the deposition? No, I think I do. I have an obligation to do that. But, but you did not do that during the deposition, I did, not, did I you? I didn't go doing that. No, I did not. Okay, and didn't you also tell them the next time to bring you a case to have two vehicles crash together? I can't, I, I think, I, 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 we didn't, we didn't, we were talking, we were talking, we were talking after the recorded statement. We were just talking after the recorded statement. So, I can't really, I, I, I think in reading the, uh, the transcript, I saw those things there, yes. So you did say that? They said that. They said they will. They said that. They said something like that, yes. So you don't dis disagree with anything they testified to? No, I've already said that I took full responsibility of this. I'm sorry and I regret it. I'm not trying to uh, really, get, really get what happened on this case. I, I'm sorry and I take full responsibility for it. I'm deeply, I regret this is not me. And I believe in answer to one of the questions a minute ago, you testified you don't have any associates in your law firm? Uh, it's only me, yes. So do you realize that this, that holding yourself as, out as Ike Nuisi and Associates is a violation of one of no, the I advertising took, rules? No, no, I, I, I took that actually because I'm going to hire some people, move some people to come and work with me. But at the time I was just starting myself, I'm the secretary. But that's a misrepresentation then on your business card, in your business name. Uh -huh. I regret I'm sorry. Thank you. I have no further questions. Mr. Nuezi, are there other jurisdictions where you have uh, practiced as a lawyer besides Texas? No, Your Honor. Uh, when was the last time that you, in fact, represented clients in Texas? That would be in the Of 2014? No, June 2000. This is when I June 2016, last year. What is your current employment? <laughs> My current what? How, what? What do you do for a living no, today? I'm not I'm working right now. I'm not working as a lawyer. I work with my wife in this house. What we're doing, I'm uh, doing retail sales of clothes and then post it. That's what I'm doing right now. Were you asked to surrender your license as a condition of the court agreeing to give you deferred adjudication instead of imprisonment or other penalty? Yes, Your Honor. And you understood that was a condition you were agreeing to? Yes, Your Honor. And I did. Would you give your response to, well, do you agree with the testimony we heard earlier that as to the suspension from 2012 to 2013 and the probation from 2013 to 14, do you agree with the testimony that you did not comply with its terms? Thank you, Your Honor. I did not quite agree with that, and I'll explain to you why. Okay, please. When that decision was reached, it was an ex parte decision, I was not present. I was not in the country. When they reached that decision and they mailed it to my house, I was not there, I did not receive it, I was not in the country, and I came back, I think around the, uh, if I can re refresh my memory very well with my traveling, because I think it was late in 2013, and I saw those documents. By the time I got that also, I also received 
the reinstatement that I had. So I called the state bar. I said, well, I have this decision. What am I supposed to do? They sent me a package stating you have to do A, B, C, D. You have to pay the certain amount of money they said I need to pay. And the person I spoke to asked me specifically, I said, have you practiced law since that time? I said, no, I don't even have a license. He said, okay, they need a statement that I did that. I have not practiced law. And if that, if when I get that statement, then they calculated the amount of money I need to pay for a couple of things. I think one was license, one was registration. And I did that. And when I paid that money, they also told me that my license had been reinstated. I, I was not aware of this uh, one seventeen hundred some dollars that I said I owe behind. If the person would have told me that, I would have paid that also. I just saw that in the course of this litigation. So if I had seen that, I would pay that. There's no reason for me not to pay that. Because even though it was an expert edition, again, I said, I was not in the country. I didn't see this. If I saw it, I would comply with it. Between January 2012, and the end of your suspension and probation, February 2014, in those two years and a month or two, were you out of the country the entire time? I could mean, no. I could mean sparingly, because I had a lot of things doing outside the country that I had maybe not to be here. Part of the reason why, if I may let you understand, is that uh, one of the only client, and that's the only complaint I have in the state bar, that I did not return her call in time to give her information about her case. That was why, because I was shuttling back and forth, back and forth. Again, I said for that this was wrong, and I'm wrong, and I'm sorry for that. Again, that's why, whatever I said I need to do, I'm willing to do it. Did you change your mailing address? between January 2012 and the end of February 2014 with the State Bar? It was in my home. So the mail that went to your home was there on those occasions when you were back in the United States? No, I was out of the country then. The mail was coming to my house, but I was out of the country. That's why I didn't get them. You didn't get the... When did you first see the judgment that suspended you from practice that was signed January 12th of 2012. It was sometimes late in 2013. And when you saw the judgment then, why did you not I take saw, steps to comply with its terms? No, I saw the judgment then. I saw the level of reinstatement. So when I called for the reinstatement, I was never told that, listen, you need to do this, uh, this part of the payment was not part of what they listed for me to do. Everything the bank asked me to do before I get arrested, I did. If they had mentioned this, I will also do it. Tell me again when you were first back in the country after January of 2012. I came in, I think it was November 2000, just before Thanksgiving 2013. You were out of the country for well, 22 months? More than that. I came in. You November. did not return to the country at any time during those 22 months? I beg your pardon. You did not return to your home at any time during those 22 months? I returned. I came, I came in briefly for a particular purpose and I left just about 48 hours I left home. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? No. I have just one. When you contacted the state bar, did you call the membership department? Yes, I believe I did. Okay, so you did not call the compliance officer as you were directed to do in the judgment, correct? I was not in the country when all this was happening. But if you I had, had the that, judgment. If I had seen that, if I had seen that, I would comply. But you, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not disputing the facts. But you stated that when you, so you knew you were under a suspension. Yes, I am under suspension. Okay, but you never called the compliance monitor as you were instructed to do in that judgment of suspension. I knew it was not suspension, but I knew. No, I never did, but whatever you want to That was why I didn't call them. I have no further questions. You may step down.
Are we are we concluded? Just, just one quick clarifying question, Mr. Weser. If you are lucky, and the board orders suspension in this case, and make as a condition of that suspension for you to pay the one thousand seven hundred plus that you did not pay as a part of the prior suspension order. Would you do that? Yes, I would do that even uh, without that order because I owe it, I will pay it. Now that I find out, I'll do it. No further questions, sir. You may step down. Anything further? Are we concluded? I think we've heard everything. Would you like a brief closing? I don't think we need I that. It was, need it's 1220 and we've got another hearing this afternoon unless uh, I think the board has the pleasure of wanting to hear anything further. I don't think so. Okay. But why don't we, unless there's anything else. As to the exhibits that uh, Mr. Nwayzi uh, offered, I'm going to nip them for purposes, <coughs> the limited purpose of the of that they were offered for. So. Anything else before we conclude for the morning? We will. We're going to start at 115, probably. We'll be here. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry that. No way. Anyway. <clears throat> thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that, that was not my intent. Well, let's be clear, though, for the record, uh, precisely what is being redacted. I assume it was the name that the was The name mentioned. of the client in yes, this case. Yes, right. yes We'll you. leave that, but that'll be redacted. And from the videotape as well, please. Yes. Okay. So, I'll just call it DP1. Is that okay? That's fine. Okay. So, this office represents DP1 mm -hmm. in a claim for injuries received in an accident with your insured. Is that correct? Yes. So, the law firm that is representing DP1 is Iruke and Uyamado. Is that correct? Correct. And that law firm is not Ike Wesley and Associates. Is that correct? Well, it. It's the same address. I, I understand that, but the question is a simple one. This is a demand letter that you are looking at. Right. Presenting a demand for payment to the insurance company. That letter did not come from Uwezi and Associates, is that correct? Well, it says it came from Aruki and Uyamadu. Okay. And it also says that Uruki and Uyamadu is the one representing these clients. Actually, I think the letter speaks for itself and it okay. says, quote, this office, end of quote, represents. Right. It doesn't specify who. Uh, uh, Your Honor, if, I may, if you look at the top of that letter, mm -hmm. it, it's got a letter heading this, Iruke and Associates. And if you go to the second page of that oh, letter. Oh, I read it. Uh, it starts with uh, this office. Yeah. I'm talking about the letter head. Oh, I understand. understand. Yeah. And then there's also a signature block that has um, Lionel Iruka. The letter speaks for itself, and, and I, I don't see how you're questioning the officer personally on matters that are beyond anything he knows about. Do you have anything else, Mr. Eco? Let me see, Jeff. So again, just so the record is clear, the only encounter you had with Mr. Mweze was on June 25th, 2014, is that correct? 
I didn't have an encounter with him that day. The undercover, the undercover officers had an encounter with him. Okay. That day. I'll pass the witness. One question for you, uh, counsel. On Mr. Uh, Noisy's card, it, uh, it says on the far right hand top corner, uh, there's a, a name, uh, Yubaba Dyke, I su suppose. What does that mean and who is that is? Does it mean lawyer in Nigerian or what does it mean? Oh, it, it appears to be like a title. It is, if I can say it correctly, it's a, a, a book, a DK, yeah. something like that. Yeah, it's, it's a, just a title, okay. it's a nickname title. Yeah. It has nothing to do with the practice of law at all. I do have a question for the officer. What was your role uh, in this investigation? I was what we call the lead case agent. Uh, I did reports, I coordinated efforts. I didn't do any of the undercover work. You did not do any of the undercover no, work? No. So I, you would not have been in contact with either Mr. Nwese or Mr. Uyamadu? Uh, correct, oh, yes. Okay. But you would be you would be knowledgeable about all the contacts that the undercover officers had with both of those yes uh, defendants yes correct okay and were there are many contacts in your um, that you are aware of with Mr. Nueze as well as many contacts with Mr. Uyamadu during the investigation um, well. They went to several, they went to a lot of places. We, we had, a, I think there was 19, well there was over, actually ended up being over 20 reports. <clears throat> they had limited contact at the attorney's office. They went two, maybe three times to the attorney's office. Most of the time they were going to the uh, clinic. The, the first attorney they met was Uyamadu and then uh, Mr. Nuizi was the second attorney they met. But the, the contacts with the attorneys, they, they were only at the office or did they have contacts with them in other places like at the clinic? No, it was only the, uh, the attorneys was only the 8303 address. Okay, thank you. Can I, can I trouble you just to, to give us an overview of the investigation and how it led to being undercover to this office? Uh, sure. Um, it started out with a informant, I guess you could say, that wanted to come forward and provide information on this scheme. Uh, the first person that the undercover officers got introduced to was the Jose Matarel Reyes. And he, basically what he did is he is a recruiter to go around and recruit participants to be in staged uh, vehicle crashes. And then they make the claim on their insurance, and then uh, <coughs> Mr. Reyes will then take take escort them to the clinic. And at the clinic was where Patrick Oswego, the clinic principal or owner, was, and then also the chiropractor uh, Deborah Osmus was. And what they do is they conduct. Uh, all kinds of therapy and uh, visits that didn't actually happen, uh, create paperwork, uh, sign paperwork and leave the dates blank and, and drive up the medical bill basically that didn't happen. Uh, the chiropractor would ask questions for several minutes without doing an examination. Um, then from there, Mr. Matero Reyes would uh, escort people to different attorney's offices the attorney office that he happened to take the undercover office officers to in this investigation happened to be the 8303 address. And then uh, they ended up meeting with Uyamadu first, and then uh, Mr. Nuizi second, and going through that entire claim process that ended up being fraudulent. Anything else? Anybody else have any questions? No. Thank you. you. You're excused. Thank Anything you. further? Judge, I'll, I'll call Mr. Mweza, please. Sorry? I'll call Mr. Mweza. Mr. Mweza. You're being called as witness.
may proceed. Thank you, Judge. The office arrangement is an issue. So, can you please clarify for the court what the office arrangement was? Uh, I just got back from suspension and I was looking for an office space to stay. So, Mr. Yamadu, Iruka Yamadu, gave me that space. It was uh, once one of the have about five, five office spaces there or four. Then he gave me one where I was staying. That's how I came to stay in that office. And I have my own separate telephone, you can see from my card. I have my separate fax. And I have my own separate name. Now, did you accept responsibility for the role you played, if any, in the underlying criminal case? I completely accept responsibility for it. I'm deeply sorry. I regret this moment of my life. This is not what I am. I'm very, very sorry. Did you pay rent to uh, them? Yes, I do, Your Honor. Is there anything in the record reflecting that rent? Yeah, if you, there, there are records, uh, there are checks which are paid uh, to them, and I can produce it if, if you want me to do that. Yes, Your Honor. I really, really regret this day. That I'll come before the Supreme Court to stand and testify in this position. This is not what I'm made for. This is not me. I've practiced for more than 20 something years. I really regret it. I'm sorry to have treated you this way. Mr. Nwese, are, are you a doctor? No, it's just uh, uh, the bad doctorship that we did and I left it. People keep using it to call me after the JD thing, but I'm not a medical doctor. And in your law office, did you have any associates? It's just me. Okay, thank you. How much was the monthly rent? And please, it was five hundred dollars a month. Did you take any referrals as part of this scheme, if I can call it that, other than the one for the officer that we heard from? No, no. no. Was he the one and only client this is, that you represented? This is one and only and the whole scheme of event which went over a year my name was never mentioned i was never there i'm not aware what's going on if i knew what was going on after speaking to them and we are talking i said did i do a good job presenting you i said i said well if i did a good job here's my card if you have anything talk to me that was how that came about and my question to you I got is into this. you pled guilty to insurance fraud between $20,000 and $100,000, is that correct? Yes, that's what his statement said. And is the amount of money that you obtained for the officer who was undercover who testified earlier some amount between twenty dollars and $100,000? Zero. You got zero money for him? There was zero money, correct? He did not obtain any money, is that what you're saying? Zero. What is the twenty to one hundred thousand represent? I think my belief is that that figure came there because probably they figured that the poor um, uh, whatever the demand they wrote there, I never saw that demand until after the fact. What was the demand? What the, the intent, the total cost of demanding would be? But zero, completely zero. So you're saying that his claim was somewhere between a twenty and one hundred thousand dollars, but you never obtained any money for him. Is that correct? Correct. And I think they got that figure because if, if I think the claim, the, the package you see, you can look through it. I don't think there was demand. Nobody paid any money to anybody. I didn't get any money myself. Zero. I never saw the check. Anything else? Mr. Uh, Nueze, um on June 25th, 2014, um, uh, the officer testified that you told him to tell the truth, but that you told him that Mr. Yu, Yu Yamadu was the office manager and that you were the attorney. Uh, do you agree that you told him that Mr. Uyu Madu was the office manager? In the course of this, when I came in, because the lawyer there was 
Leonardo Ruka. I know him. He's the one who asked me to please do this for me. He was out of town. Was out of the country. I believe it was somewhere in, in uh, Amsterdam. So he said, please do this presentation for me. And that's what I went in there to do. And I guess the question I'm going to, did you know at that time on June uh, 25th that Mr. Uyu Madu was not a lawyer? No, I'm not aware of him. I didn't know that. Anybody else have any questions for Mr. Nwazi? I have some cross-examination questions. Go ahead. Isn't it, you agree that they told you that one of the people wasn't in the accident? I saw, I saw that statement when they gave me the printout, but if you look at it, I did not reply to it. I did not, I, I did not give any response to it because I didn't hear it. I did not say yes, I did not say no because I did not notice it. But I saw it in the printout. But they statement. told you that on the on the twenty fifth. I, I can't recall it because I didn't answer it. Well, I have a video if you'd like to see yourself saying that. No, they they mentioned that I said right now. You know, we're just we're just talking. I'm not memorizing what I said. So when they said when they said that issue that somebody was that, was, that a particular person was not in the accident and they were putting him there, I did not rep I did not respond to that. But you went ahead and went to that man's deposition as if he had been in the accident, correct? No. Both of them were there. I was giving, I was giving them benefit of doubt that we were getting represented by the uh, representative uh, for Mr. Ruka. Bear in mind, I'm not a lawyer in this case. Uh, because... Well, they... It, can I say this, please? Please. For you to accept a case, for you to be able to withdraw in a case, you have to be the person in charge of the case to say, I'm withdrawing from this case. I couldn't withdraw. When I saw those things, I had a duty and obligation to tell Mr. Ruka, these people don't look so quiet to me. But he was not in town. You, so did, I, you don't think you had an obligation to correct the deposition of the, office, the undercover officer you knew was not at the accident during the deposition? No, I think I do. I have obligation to do that, but but you did not do that during the deposition. I, no, did I didn't go doing that. No, I did not. Okay, and didn't you also tell them the next time to bring you a case to have two vehicles crash together? I can't. I, I think I, 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 we didn't. We didn't. We we're talking. We were talking. We we're talking after the recorded statement. We we're just talking after the recorded statement. So I can't really. I, I, I think. In reading the, uh, the transcript, I saw those things there, yes. So you did say that? They said that. They said they will. They said that. They said something like that, yes. So you don't dis disagree with anything they testified to? No, I've already said that I took full responsibility of this. I'm sorry and I regret it. I'm not trying to uh, really, get, really get what happened on this case. I, I'm sorry and I take full responsibility for it. I'm deeply, I regret this is not me. And I believe in answer to one of the questions a minute ago, you testified you don't have any associates in your law firm? Uh, it's only me, yes. So do you realize that this, that holding yourself as, out as Ike Nuisi and Associates is a violation of one of no, the I advertising took, rules? No, no, I, I, I took that as because I'm going to hire some people, move some people to come and work with me. But at the time I was just starting myself and the secretary. But that's a misrepresentation then on your business card, in your business name. Uh -huh. I regret I'm sorry. Thank you. I have no further questions. Mr. Nuezi, are there other jurisdictions where you have uh, practiced as a lawyer besides Texas? No, Your Honor. Uh, when was the last time that you, in fact, represented clients in Texas? Of 2014? No, June 2000. This is when I June 2016, last year. What is your current employment? <laughs> My current what? How, what? What do you do for a living no, today? I'm not working right now. I'm not working as a lawyer. I work with my wife in this house. What we're doing, I'm uh, 
you do retail sales of clothes and then post it. That's what I'm doing right now. Were you asked to surrender your license as a condition of the court agreeing to give you deferred adjudication instead of imprisonment or other penalty? Yes, Your Honor. And you understood that was a condition you were agreeing to? Yes, sir. And I did. Would you give your response to, well, do you agree with the testimony we heard earlier that as to the suspension from 2012 to 2013 and the probation from 2013 to 14, do you agree with the testimony that you did not comply with its terms? Thank you, Your Honor. I did not quite agree with that, and I'll explain to you why. Okay, please. When that decision was reached, it was an ex parte decision. I was not present. I was not in the country. When they read that decision and they mailed it to my house, I was not there. I did not receive it. I was not in the country. And I came back, I think around the, uh, if I can re refresh my memory very well with my traveling, because I think it was late in 2013. And I saw those documents. By the time I got that also, I also received the reinstatement that I had. So I called the state bar. I said, well, I have this decision. What am I supposed to do? They sent me a package stating you have to do A, B, C, D. You have to pay the certain amount of money they said I need to pay. And the person I spoke to asked me specifically, I said, have you practiced law since that time? I said, no, I don't even have a license. He said, okay, they need a statement that I did that. I have not practiced law. And if that, if when I get that statement, that they calculated the amount of money I need to pay for a couple of things. I think one was license, one was registration. And I did that. And when I paid that money, they also told me that my license had been reinstated. I, I was not aware of this uh, one seventeen hundred some dollars that I said I owe behind. If the person would have told me that, I would have paid that also. I just saw that in the course of this litigation. So if I had seen that, I would pay that. That's no reason for me not to pay that. Because even though it was an expert edition, again, I said, I was not in the country. I didn't see this. If I saw it, I would comply with it. Between January 2012 and the end of your suspension and probation, February 2014, in those two years and a month or two, were you out of the country the entire time? I come in, no. I come in sparingly because I had a lot of things to do outside the country that I had maybe not to be here. Part of the reason why, if I may let you understand, is that uh, one of the only client, and that's the only complaint I have in the state bar, that I did not return her call in time to give her information about her case. That was why, because I was shuttling back and forth, back and forth. Again, I said for this one that this was wrong, and I'm wrong, and I'm sorry for that. And that's why, whatever I said I need to do, I'm willing to do it. Did you change your mailing address between January 2012 and the end of February 2014 with the state bar? It was in my home. So the mail that went to your home was there on those occasions when you were back in the United States? No, I was out of the country then. The mail was coming to my house, but I was out of the country. That's why I didn't get it. You didn't get the... When did you first see the judgment that suspended you from practice that was signed January 12th of 2012? It was sometimes late in 2013. And when you saw the judgment then, why did you not I take saw, steps to comply with its terms? No, I saw the judgment then. I saw the level of reinstatement. So when I called for the reinstatement, I was never told that, listen, you need to do this, uh, this part of the payment was not part of what they listed for me to do. Everything the bank asked me to do before I get arrested, I did. If they had mentioned this, I will also do it. Tell me again when you were first back in the country after January of 
came in, I think it was November 2000, just before Thanksgiving 2013. You were out of the country for oh, 22 yes. months? More than that. I came in You November. did not return to the country at any time during those 22 months? I beg your pardon. You did not return to your home at any time during those 22 months? I returned. I came, I came in briefly for a particular purpose and I left just about 48 hours I left. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? No. I have just one. When you contacted the state bar, did you call the membership department? Yes, I believe I did. Okay, so you did not call the compliance officer as you were directed to do in the judgment, correct? I was not in the country when all this was happening. But if you I had, had the that, judgment. If I had seen that, if I had seen that, I would comply. But you, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not disputing the facts. But you stated that when you. So you knew you were under a suspension. Yes, I knew I was suspension. Okay, but you never called the compliance monitor as you were instructed to do in that judgment of suspension. I knew it was not suspension. But I knew, no, I never did, but what I did that was why I didn't call them. I have no further questions. We may step down. Are we, are we concluded? Just, just one quick clarifying question. Mr. Weather, if you are lucky and the board orders suspension in this case and make as a condition of that suspension for you to pay the 1700 plus that you did not pay as a part of the prior suspension order. Would you do that? Yes, I would do that even uh, without that order because I owe it, I will pay it. Now that I find out, I'll do it. No further questions, sir. You may step down. Anything further are we concluded? I think we've heard everything. Would you like a brief closing? I don't think we need that. It's 1220 and we've got another hearing this afternoon unless uh, I think the board has the pleasure of wanting to hear anything further. I don't think so. Okay. But why don't we, unless there's anything else. As to the exhibits that uh, Mr. Nwayzi uh, offered, I'm going to nip them for purposes, the limited purpose of the of that they were offered for. So. Anything else before we conclude for the morning? We will, we're going to start at 115.